afternoon, everybody. As Michael has said, my name is Tony Michael Loon. I'm from the School of Nursing in the University of Ulster, and I'm part of a multidisciplinary research team that's working on the field of improving obesity management. Um, as Michael has identified, obesity is a global problem, and there is hardly a nation in the world who doesn't have it as a key health priority to improve their management of um, the evidence, the level of obesity, and um, the structures that are in place to deal with it. And we are looking on a, a body of research to try and improve that management. Today, currently, because of the prevalence of obesity, you can hardly lift a newspaper or turn on the TV without seeing a headline related to obesity, the presence of it and its management. The types of headlines that you see identify the cost. For example, there's a daily cost of two million uh, because of diabetes medications, and that was a 2014 headline, which has probably escalated today in 2018 from that cost. Obesity is seen as second only to smoking as a cause of premature death um, in Europe. And although the level of obesity has been registered as being significant in terms of the death rate, the structures in place to support people who have obesity and who want to change are nowhere near the same as they are for people with smoking cessation programs. And that is one of the issues that we have identified as part of our body of uh, work. If we continue on the current trend, by 2025, one-fifth of the world's adults will be obese, and we currently are on track for that to happen. Uh, obesity not only occurs within the public, it also occurs within the healthcare professionals. And the latest statistics have showed us that one in four nurses in England are obese. And that brings with it questions about role modelling and uh, credibility in terms of health promotion activities. Within Northern Ireland, 63% of the adult population are overweight or obese. So within a global context, what does that mean? The nature of death has changed. Most deaths now are caused by communicable disease or by chronic illness, not communicable diseases. So 65% of all deaths are related to uh, deaths such as heart disease, uh, diabetes, respiratory disease, cancers. 36 million annual global deaths are related to chronic illness. In the UK, the latest statistics identify that 1 in 11 deaths are related to obesity, which is a preventable condition and a treatable condition. Obesity occurs across all age groups, all genders, all social classes, and it results in the health and well-being of individuals being compromised and societal welfare programs being compromised as well. So that's the global perspective. In terms of the Northern Ireland perspective, six adults in every ten are either overweight or obese. And that's quite a stark statistic um, to think about in terms of chronic illness. The costing that I had was that it was uh, 37 million, but as Michael has identified, that's near now um, half a million pounds in terms of cost to the economy. The main contributing factors are cardiac disease, colorectal cancer, and type 2 diabetes, all related to the presence of obesity. If we take the example of, of diabetes as a working example, the statistics that are currently available um, are that there are 85,000 um, citizens in Northern Ireland with diabetes. Of that 85,000, 90% have type 2 diabetes, which is related to the presence of obesity. And so if you can manage and control obesity, you can influence that level of type 2 diabetes. And there's projected ongoing yearly increases of 3,000 um, new diagnoses. But I know that uh, there are new figures to be released next month, which have shown that these figures have escalated and they prevalence of diabetes is much greater now than what those uh, figures identify. So what happens in practice in terms of management or treatment of um, obesity? To date, no single nation has turned around the obesity epidemic. There is evidence there may be slowing pockets of obesity, but no nation in the world is on track to achieve the targets they've set themselves for the reduction of obesity or for the management of it. The UK has now been labelled as the fat man of Europe. Uh, I saw an interview with the chair of the National Obesity Forum recently who identified that there's 5% higher prevalence of obesity in the UK than any other European nation. The Royal College of Physicians in 2013 identified that obesity management strategies were extremely patchy. The uh, Academy of the Medical Royal Colleges in 2014 identified that there are no strategies in place that are having a significant impact. 
In 2018, Kaplan and colleagues identified that this inconsistent understanding of the impact of obesity and the need for management. And they had a very large sample size, and what they were able to identify that participants within their study who were obese, 50% of them didn't recognize that they were obese. 48% felt that there was no health consequences for them in the future um, of the presence of obesity. And the medical staff that were involved identified that both of those were um, barriers in terms of treating patients, and they identified other barriers such as time management as an issue in terms of trying to interact with patients. And so that thread identifies that currently practices with obesity management are ineffective and that has led us to a body of research to see if we can impact on improving that situation. So this started with my doctoral study and uh, the purpose of the study was we wanted to establish what were the attitudes of clinicians to patients with obesity that they were seeing on a continual basis and nothing was changing with them. And we were trying to identify what were the variables that influenced obesity management in practice. So the study design, uh, or sorry, our outcomes that we wanted to assess was how motivated were clinicians to treat patients, what was the likelihood of discussing weight management with these patients, and how much time was spent with these patients as opposed to other patients. So the methodology that we um, developed was an innovative, interactive online study in which we had three data collection tools. We had clinical vignettes in which um, participants were presented with scenarios of patients with chronic illness and obesity. And there is now a large body of evidence to show that the use of vignettes is a robust methodology, that what clinicians predict they will do in practice actually reflects what they do in practice. We also collected demographic data and measured the attitude um, of our participants towards individuals with obesity. We had a multidisciplinary sample from the Belfast Trust, the Western Trust, Ulster University and Queen's University. So this was a unique study exploring influences on obesity management and we discovered as we developed the study and started data collection that it was actually a, a very effective methodology that clinicians were interested in obesity research and really engaged with what we were trying to do. So this is just an example of what a vignette looked like. There's a little stem uh, written about the patient in terms of their chronic condition and their obesity level. Um, a photograph was included to enhance realism so that participants would look at this as what they would actually see in practice. And then they answered the same questions after each stem. So each participant completed eight um, vignettes, all of which were unique. And so every participant had a set of unique vignettes. We also collected information on gender, age, experience, professional group. We asked the participants their weight and height and we generated their BMI for them and we felt that this was a CPD opportunity for participants. Some people may not have wanted to know their weight but, or their BMI but um, by the end of participation they knew it. We also measured uh, obesity attitudes and this was an interactive process in real time. As we generated the participants' BMI, we fed it back to them and we asked them to classify it within the standardised boundaries. We also fed back to them their attitudes and we classified that within a global context of what was known about attitudes. So it was an interactive process and it was an opportunity for CPD for participants if they wanted to use that information in that manner. So what did we find out? We had a large sample, which is why I identified that this was an effective methodology and clinicians really engaged with it. We had 427 participants, which resulted in almost 3,500 vignettes. Our sample was predominantly female. It represented nursing, medicine and dietetics. All age groups were represented. We had an experienced sample with almost 50% of the sample having more than 10 years experience. When we established uh, the participants' BMI, we were able to see that 3% of the sample were underweight, 58% were normal weight, 26 were obese, and 13 or 26 were pre-obese, and 13 were obese. So 39% of the sample were overweight or obese. And while that's below the national average, it's quite high for a profession that is responsible for health promotion activities. And so there are concerns about the impact that that may have upon clinical practice. We were also able to identify that 21% of the sample couldn't classify their own BMI. They didn't know what banding they fell into and that again was a worrying uh, finding because it may impact on clinicians' ability to recognise appropriate windows of opportunity to intervene with patients. So with regards to attitudes, 91% of our sample held an anti-fat attitude. 
and that is comparable with general population samples, that's what's known. Um, yet 54% of the sample reported affinity with people with obesity, and that's an important point because affinity is related to being able to socially engage with the patient because it is linked to a liking or an understanding of a person or an issue. And it can be seen in practice in terms of eye contact, body language, tone of voice. So it's important for a therapeutic relationship with a patient that affinity is there. 72% of our sample reported a societal preference for thin people. Although our sample recorded a very high level of anti-fat bias, that wasn't influenced in any way by a participant's characteristics. So for example, if the participant themselves were overweight or obese, they had the same level of anti-fat bias as a participant who didn't. So there was no in-group protection in terms of your own obesity level. Um, Higher levels of affinity were reported by females, by participants with a higher BMI, and by nurses. So in a clinical encounter, a patient and a clinician brings elements to that encounter, and the vignettes allowed us to look at the influence of both sides of that coin. So the characteristics of clinician that um, influence the encounter. Um, age influenced motivation to treat. Clinicians who were in the 39 to 58 age group who were more motivated to treat the patient. Uh, dietitians and medical staff reported that they were more motivated than nurses. We don't have any data to explain why that is, but the nurses in our sample had the highest levels of pre-obesity and obesity, so that may impact on their ability in terms of how they see themselves as a role model to work with patients, and it also may influence how effective they think interventions are going to be. Uh, likelihood to discuss weight. Uh, those with 10 to 15 years experience were more likely to discuss weight than other groups. And time spent with the patient. Dietetic staff reported spending more time with patients than other groups. And those in the first 10 years of practice spent less time. And that may be related to confidence levels. So what did the patient bring to the encounter? Patients with high, who presented with high BMIs, clinicians were much more motivated to treat those patients. However, if that patient was unconcerned about their weight or was a poor attender, then clinicians were demotivated to engage with the patient. With regards to likelihood to discuss weight, if a BMI was rising or there were large amounts of weight loss or gain, then it was more likely that weight would be discussed. However, again, if the patient was unconcerned or there was little change from the last encounter, then weight was not likely to be discussed. With regards to time spent with the patient, again, as a rising BMI occurred, more time was spent with the patient, but if the patient was unconcerned or not in a change from the last time, then less time was spent with the patient. So what are the key facts we need to take from that to develop future research? Clinicians had high levels of anti-fat bias, but yet still reported affinity with patients. That's important because it allows us to be optimistic that given the right skill set and the right time, that clinicians would engage with patients with weight management and they would do it in a therapeutic manner. Demotivated patients decrease clinician motivation and time spent with the patient. Patient engagement would seem to be central to engaged clinicians. And clinicians incorrectly classified their own BMI. And that's a worry and concern that if clinicians can't um, see appropriate intervention points, that they become missed opportunities. So the, the two key points that we have taken out from our body of research so far is for a successful clinical encounter, we need activated patients, and we need clinicians that are going to engage with that activated patient. And that has led to the body of work that we are now working on. So our focus on activating patients. In 2016, we were able to gain ASRC funding, and the Research and Development Office locally matched that funding. And uh, we used that to increase public engagement with the topic. We worked with a theatre company and presented um, a piece of theatre in the MAC in Belfast called um, Debating the F Word, in which we had um, participants in, from the public who had levels of obesity or normal weight and clinicians, and which we discussed issues around with the presence of obesity, how people felt about it, how they would like the um, engagement to be framed and to happen, what sort of language would you used. And um, that was a very well received piece of work. Um, in 2017, we got R&D um, funding to help us develop a project to improve engaged communication. And part of that, we're working on focus groups with patients to identify how they would like the issue addressed. 
And what we're hearing from patients is they want clinicians to intervene. They want someone to tell them, yes, there is an issue here and we will work with you in terms of um, dealing with that. And they want support services to be in place to help them. And currently their perception is that unless you have a diagnosed condition, a comorbidity, that there is no support for you out there if you want to lose weight. And indeed, one of our participants told us, who had a BMI, I, I think probably about 40, that if um, he was jealous of the people who had diabetes because he felt there was more support structures in place for them than there was for him, and that he would be glad when he would get to that level because he felt he would be helped then to lose weight. So people with diabetes or with obesity are not feeling supported in terms of trying to address the issue. We also have another doctoral study which started last month and in which we're going to um, look at how uh, engaged conversations take place in practice. So that is the elements of work that we're doing with activating patients. In parallel, we're looking at trying to engage clinicians with the therapeutic um, encounter. And we have established a large research team which is multidisciplinary, multi-organisational and we have a large PPI element in that in terms of trying to develop a body of work that's going to improve practice. So our plan is to run a multi-centre RCT to, and we're going to develop and test an intervention to improve clinical engagement with obesity management. So this element of it is working with clinicians to try and improve their skills with engaged conversations in practice. And again, the R&D office award that we got last year has allowed us to run focus groups with clinicians to help us shape how that intervention will look like. And the feedback we're getting from clinicians is that there are a number of barriers in place in practice for them with engaging with patients. Time is obviously an issue. They're unsure of what the appropriate intervention point should be. Should it be when an acute illness occurs and a patient is aware of their vulnerability? Or is that an inappropriate time for it to happen? Um, clinicians feel that they're should we open this can of worms because there's nowhere for us to refer patients to in Northern Ireland? There's no consistent structure referral process for patients to be referred to. So clinicians are anxious about introducing something that will upset patients and then they will have nowhere to refer them on to. And there, there has been work done and we just need simple interventions to uh, improve that. For example, uh, Logan colleagues in 2014 in Scotland did a very large study and they um, identified that a five minute intervention in an acute setting in which a clinician said to a patient, yes, there is a problem here, I'm willing to work with you on that problem. There's a referral structure, we'll refer you to the structure. When those patients were reviewed a year later, they had sustained weight loss. But there is no referral structure in Northern Ireland currently. So that is also another element, a strand to our body of work in which policy drivers need to start engaging with and develop. So our um, plan is to submit in April for a, a National Institute of Health Research funding to fund the multi-centre RCT that we're going to run. So we're working on two parallel strands to engage patients and or to engage clinicians and activate patients. So I think there's going to be a question time at the end if anybody has any questions. So thank you for your time and attention.